people here, right? academics and operators, about where are we in crowdfunding, both on the equity side and on the debt side. So Prosper did $369 million of loans connecting people to people, people who wanted to invest and people who wanted to borrow. That was in the year 2013, 369 million. We did $1.6 billion in 2014. It took Prosper eight years to do one billion. It took us six months to do the second one billion and even less to do the third one billion. That's how fast this crowdfunding is changing. And you will be here in a year and two and three years and wonder why there was only this many platforms and this many people. This is a new idea that's got a lot of room to run. And the reason it works, the reason crowdfunding works and online marketplaces work is because there's mutual benefits to both sides. There is no loser. Who knows the name of the largest transportation company on this planet? Uber. Uber doesn't own one automobile, not one truck. All they're doing is the same thing we're doing in equity and debt crowdfunding. We're connecting one group and another group. We're transparent and we're quick and easy with a good experience. And so for Prosper, we're connecting people who want to borrow money and people who want to invest money. Airbnb, the largest provider of rooms to stay, they don't own one hotel room. That's how much this is changing, the concept, the ways to work together. And I think one of the critical things for us all to remember here today is that we're not competing with each other. It's not that booth versus the other booth. It's not how much market share does this one have versus that one. We are making together in crowdfunding, in equity crowdfunding, in debt crowdfunding, this huge pie. And if we work together and we're trust and transparent with best practices, this pie can be huge and there'll be tons to share. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Richard, who's gonna take you into some of the academic philosophy. But I assure you, this is not a trend, this is not a fad, this is something that's a mega, mega wave, and we're very, very early. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Dr. Richard Swart, please. <clears throat> Go Bears, okay. How many Berkeley people in the room today? Well, we got John Medved and uh, Ron Suber, both Berkeley alumni, so I have to give a shout out to Berkeley for one of our jokes. How many of you are Stanford people? Good, I could pick on you. I also went to Stanford for a degree, so the joke is Stanford creates jobs, Berkeley creates industries, and we create fundamental disruptions in technology. But I'm not going to be an academic today. I'm going to ask your permission to allow me to get a little punchy. You know, I'm in a pinstripe soup. Um, I met with Commissioner Stein yesterday from the SEC. I spent a week in Washington freezing my butt off with the warm weather back there. I've got some updates from DC to share with all of you. So let's have a moment of silence for Title III. It is dead. Title III, as it exists now, is dead. It will not be going anywhere. The SEC is not going to take action. But Congress is going to act. In 30 to 45 days, there will be a new Title III bill introduced, which has already been drafted, which will luckily make it higher cap raises and less filing requirements and hopefully less onerous, which may be bad news for the accountants and attorneys in the room, but for the entrepreneurs, it's probably good news. That being said, I have spent a lot of time internationally in the last year, to the deep chagrin of my wife. <coughs> Where's the clicker here? Is this it? So we're going to talk about things in a very interesting perspective. I've been involved in a lot of very weird meetings lately. Policy meetings, meetings with foreign presidents, literally. I uh, had a long discussion with Jesse Jackson about crowdfunding recently. Why does the president of Iceland and Jesse Jackson want to talk to me? That's my wife always asks that question too. The answer is because crowdfunding is turning into a significant disruption. So today we're going to take a look back in history. You have now entered 2040. We are writing the history of the disruption, which was alternative finance. President Austin Lee, one of my favorite students from Berkeley, 
And by the way, he's president of Google because Google is much more powerful in the US Congress and administration at this point, was able to realize the power of data and push through a lot of changes. This is the SEC, as it was known in 2015. 600,000 pages of regulation. Dozens of staffers that exist in walled offices with three ring binders of paper stacked against the walls with paper notes and index systems that were invented in the 1950s, keeping track of your companies. This is the technology which protects Wall Street. This is what trading looks like today. Those of you who are not geeks, that is the Borg. Okay. Hyper-efficient technology, ruthless efficiency, taking over markets and essentially crowding out wherever it goes. The stock market does not provide returns to retail investors. We know that. We have a slight problem in the world, though. Today, there are approximately 750 million class people, million middle class individuals in the world. By the end of the decade, there will be 3.2 billion middle class individuals in the world. Disposable incomes, needing to have retirement accounts, seeking alpha, and the vast majority of them exist in economies without access to financial returns and functioning banking systems, or like China, fairly corrupt banking systems and real estate systems. It's a house of cards that will soon collapse. This is still Wall Street. They're having a lot of fun still. Too big to fail didn't really have much impact, did it? Sorry, Goldman Sachs, but I'm not a fan. The party continues. Wall Street continues to ignore the disruption coming from Silicon Valley, thinking that all of us are essentially this. Some young punk kid with a fun idea who's going to crash and burn, not knowing the Ron Subers of the world are catching up with them. The next leaders of America are gonna look a lot more like this than they are like this. This is happening today, everywhere. In Egypt, where I lectured recently, unemployment is 52% of people under age 30. In other parts of the Arab Spring, it's as high as 70%. You have a generation of technically skilled students who are mobile and technology savvy who have zero opportunities for jobs, where there are no hirings and there is no functioning economy, where companies are propped up. The Egyptian economy would collapse today were it not for FDI, foreign direct investment and remittances. Literally, there's no economic activity occurring. It's being propped up by diaspora and FDI. There's gonna be a demand for jobs, which we cannot fill with our economy. One of the problems is the historical coupling between GDP growth and job creation, for the first time in heck, economic history has come to an end. GDP growth is having zero impact on job creation in America and Western Europe, period, end of story. The rents and the gains are not flowing to the middle class and they're gonna get pissed off. They want to invest and we're talking about billions of people, not 100 or 200 million people. I'm not an economist, a political scientist, a finance expert, and I certainly don't pretend to be a lawyer, but DC has a really big problem on their hands figuring out structurally how to increase and shore up the middle class. So I'm gonna get into my boring slides and then we'll talk a little bit about what happened in 2015. <clears throat> so the banks, weren't moving fast. The data showed retrospectively the average bank pivoted their business model somewhere between 15 and 20 years it would take for a bank to make a fundamental change in their business models. Silicon Valley and the financial tech disruption was happening at internet speed of about 18 to 24 months for significant changes in models. The banks literally could not keep up and many times when they complained to Congress, 
their challenge was the risk modeling. It's not just that they have so many disclosure requirements and so much burdensome paperwork, which is true, but they complained that they were not allowed by their risk models and their audit requirements to adopt new data sources and experiment and innovate in how they underwrote risk. So while these shadow banking or the unbanked or whatever you want to call these new disruptive companies were innovating with big data techniques and figuring out how to be much more efficient and much more smart about underwriting risk, the banks were hamstrung. So the books are still being written about the demise of the banking sector and the rise of the technology sectors. But given that the technology sectors are gathering approximately 320 points of data about you every minute from your cell phone, and they can have psychographic and demographic profiles of you, which would make the NSA ashamed of their lack of data access, they were able to figure out models to partner with innovative technology companies to deliver products to you on an on-demand basis and evolve through the life cycle of your business evolution with you in a way that banks couldn't keep up. So when Citibank and Goldman Sachs went out of business in the late 2020s, and Google, and the resurgent Microsoft, which by the way came back to life when they invented quantum computing, which is not that far away, the technology companies now control most of financial activity in America. Globally, what we saw was the valley of death started to compress. In many parts of the world, micro-lending, the Grameen model, allowed entrepreneurs to get a few hundred US dollars equivalent in financing. But to get banked, these companies needed to have something around the order of a million to two million in revenue in most of the developing world. There was a slight problem with that model. So in the 2020s, what happened is micro-lending and Axion and other groups in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other organizations started innovating and in figuring out how to connect networks of non-governmental institutions, foundations, and people through crowdfunding to deliver as-needed economic resources to the developing frontier. We also saw an amazing thing happen. Crowdfunding shifted gender dynamics in the 2020s. We knew from the 2014s and 2015s that crowdfunding was more effective for women than men. What was amazing was the venture capital industry started to pay attention. Because in the 2010s, venture capitalists basically would not invest in women-backed businesses. Very rarely. Less than 5%. By the 2020s, the compelling data from crowdfunding forced venture activity, venture firms to recognize the fact that women entrepreneurs oftentimes are much more successful than male entrepreneurs. And the money started flowing to women, not just in the US and the developed world, but also in the Middle East, where the fact that the imams declared that equity crowdfunding, which happened in 2013, by the way, was Sharia compliant, allowed new Islamic financial models to actually finance the development and the dreams of female entrepreneurs in Muslim countries for the first time. So crowdfunding has politi had political effects, social effects, financial disruptions, and it was not just a crazy idea by a few kids in San Francisco who wanted to sell a few t-shirts or get a rock concert financed. And Google, by the way, acquires Kickstarter in 2019. <clears throat> Business curriculums also changed dramatically, and the idea of social innovation and social investing and social finance became a core component of business curriculum around the world. We realized that the whole cycle of thinking about a product by a bunch of smart MBAs and engineers and developing a product in a sandbox and then having a stupid focus group with a one-way mirror and asking a bunch of random people you kidnap in a shopping mall and bribing them to tell you about your new product isn't the best way of finding out what your customers really want. And we also found out that the venture capital community in the late 2010s was continuing their flight to risk so dramatically that crowdfunding filled that void. And it stepped in and was able to finance what was happening where the angels and the VCs feared to tread. 
We also saw amazing thing happen in the early 2020s where the Rockefeller Foundation and the Clinton Global Initiative and the Bill Gates Foundation and the World Bank figured out how to actually activate diaspora networks and connect diaspora to innovation globally, literally creating a global solution network for the first time that allowed indigenous entrepreneurs to get financing from the diaspora without the layer of financial corruption and fraud, which in 2015 was taking 91% of the money out of that channel in most developing countries. So looking back, we saw that what we thought was the collaborative economy of Airbnb and Uber and these fantastic models really was the dawn of collaborative capitalism, where wealth can be created not just through traditional channels, but you can actually co-create wealth through combining innovation and investing and collaboration. So crowdfunding fundamentally changed the nature of wealth creation in the US. I apologize for having no slides, no data, no charts, and no statistics. I'm sure I'm going to be banned from the faculty now, but thank you for your time.